It's said that the spirit of the Mayan ancestors haunt these hills. It was from the rich soil of the Mayans that the Guatemala of today emerged. A proud people and a proud country. It is a country of stark contrast, the richest of all the Central American countries in terms of natural resources. But 85% of the population lives in poverty. 2% of the country owns 80% of the land. But those figures do little to put a face on those who suffer here the most, the Guatemalan children. Here in Guatemala City, there are more than 5,000 children living in the streets. And the majority of them are either thieves, prostitutes, or glue sniffers. They themselves are the survivors of a civil war that's gone on for more than 40 years at the cost of thousands of lives. And yet, even they would be considered privileged when you compare them to the ones living in the fourth world. Smoke clouds the sky and vultures fill the air as a repulsive stench permeates the area surrounding the Guatemala City dump. While the dump's residents go about the daily routine of scavenging to survive, an American woman goes about her chosen work of trying to make a difference here. People make um, their houses out of cardboard or out of, what, out of plastic bags or whatever, but they're usually pushed away and they have to build again in another place because the government comes in and plows through here. And they'll just plow through their homes if they need to. There's a stove on the left that they build from whatever they find there on the dump. You can imagine how sterile that is. Kari Engen left her hometown of Rockville, Maryland in 1987 and set out on her own to fulfill a spiritual mission. This is her story. A story documented by filmmaker John Bafar. A presidential election first brought him to Guatemala in 1989. But soon after meeting Kari, he switched his focus and spent the next nine years documenting her life and those around her. What follows is the end result of that effort. Hello. The reason that more than 1,000 children live in the Guatemala City dump can be blamed in part on the country's civil war. This war has claimed over 100,000 lives and left many children orphans with no skills and no place else to go. Over half of Guatemala's population of 10 million people live in Guatemala City. Most are Indian children who have come from the exterior or countryside, hoping to find work. More often than not, they are disappointed and soon turn to whatever survival tactics work shoe shines, prostitution, begging, or petty theft. It's often not as much a choice as a necessity. 15 quetzales. To survive. 15. 15. Yes. 
Nothing I have seen or read about has prepared me for the surreal quality of this environment. This 10-acre hellhole of refuse and humanity functioning as a kind of microcosm, its own little world. It is inconceivable to me that four generations of human beings have lived what they might consider a predictable everyday life in this horrific place. They do the glue to, to, to get away the hunger pains that they have, or just to kind of get out of reality of really what they're living in. Um, I know families that have been born there, raised there, they've married there, they have their own kids there, and it's their life, you know, and it's just been kind of a, a mundane thing all the time that they don't see any hope of getting, getting a better situation and getting out of there. To give them hope, Kari has devoted her life to the children of the fourth world in a place that's without running water, full of disease, and notoriously dangerous. It, it can be violent, you know, you really, you really have to pray hard when you go down there. You have people there that rob and steal, and they steal from the other homes, they burn down the other homes. They, they've had machete killings and, and machete fights. And some of the kids have told me, oh, we found my uncle down there. He was buried under the trash, and they killed him the other night. You know, and they talk about all the blood. They don't talk about skin knees or cut fingers. They cut, talk about the dead people, you know, and all the blood that they see down there. Just the situations in which they live, it's, it's, it's awesome, you know, the way the kids fight with the vultures for the food. It's like a whole nother world. A lot of people call this the fourth world because they all have their own way of living, their own way of, of um, working, and it's just a, a, a lot different than, than in, the, in the outside world. You can see right now they're they're just trying to get the best pickings that they can. Um, some people have different things that they pick at. They either get metal or plastic bags or plastic cartons. And if you go into someone else's territory, it can be trouble for you. For you. Because if they get, you start picking out metal when it's not your territory, they'll, they'll get on your case. The eerie images, <laughs> the cries from the children's hunger, and the faces of despair, they all tell a story of life in the fourth world. But amongst all this filth and darkness is a light that shines on the people of the fourth world. It's called mi refugio, my refuge. Skills are learned, meals are shared, and smiles are plentiful. <laughs> and at this refuge, the children are able to escape the refuse of the dump and receive an education that gives hope for a better tomorrow. In 1987, Kari Engen started Mi Refugio a place where the children of the dump could go and receive nourishment for the mind, body, and more importantly to Kari, the soul. She began her mission work in Mexico, working with orphans while she was still in high school. Kari says it was divine inspiration that brought her here to Guatemala. When I was younger, I would watch the TV and I'd see all those, those announcements, you know, for like the hungry and all the, all the starving children in the world, and I really had a desire to want to help them. It was more of a desire to help the poor, not just the hungry, but poor children. That desire to help soon put her behind the wheel of a van headed to Guatemala. Once there, she sought advice from a local pastor. The pastor told me, well, have you ever seen the dump? Have you ever seen the Guatemalan dump? And I said, the Guatemalan dump? I've never even heard of it, you know? And, and he said, well, you haven't seen anything yet. If you've seen all these other poor sections, you haven't seen anything until you've seen the dump. So we went down there, and when I saw the dump, it was just like a piece, 
you know, there was such a peace that I got from being there. I said, this is it. You know, he says, well, go for it. If this is what God's showing you to do, go for it. This is Kari's new home. These are her neighbors. But this is the reason she came. Before opening the school, Kari spent an entire year in the dump. She did so to gain the trust of the people. In the process, she received a first-hand education on their problems and way of life. They're using the, they're using the cardboard for sure. They're probably going to use it for their house to, uh, to help reinforce their house and prepare it for the rainy season that's coming up. And, um, Rainy season is really rough because all this becomes mud and slush and, and, and um, you just sink a lot in the mud. He's got a glue sniffer up there. He's getting out his glue to get his fix. High behind that wall. He's talking to himself. And, but whatever they're hallucinating, you know, you never know what they're hallucinating. So. He, start, he threw a bottle at us. Did you see the bottle he threw at us? Then he hid it right behind the wall and took out his glue thing. We spoke with a few of the dump's residents, and while the circumstances that put them here varied, they all shared a desire for a better life. Why don't you want to leave? Because my family lives here, and this is where we've always lived. The familia. So you do want to leave? Well, yes, certainly. Well, I want to leave one day. Si? To where? Wherever I can go. This little boy on my right is um, Gustavo, and he's been with me in the school for the two years that I've had the school. Um, he's been orphaned here in the dump, and a family took him in. I'd really like to come and see him be at the home. He's really underweight. He's 12 years old, and um, he's very malnutritioned, and has a, has a problem in his learning abilities. But we're just praying that he's going to become better and become what God wants him to become. Right? As a king is born to the throne, so are the children born to the dump. Their world is a birthright they never asked for. They are the dump's most tragic victims. But at 7.30 each morning, those victims now have hope, because that's when their school day begins at Mi Refugio. start with 10, 12-year-olds that don't even know how to read and write, hold a pencil, how to color. Well, it's been such a different atmosphere for them that they've just gotten really adjusted rapidly to the, to the system here at the school, and, and um, they, they love it. It's, it's a joyful place for them. It's a change of, a change of sp uh, pace for them. Um, they're not always running through the dump all day, but at least they get a new experience, you know, with the, with the materials that we get and all the colors. We try to make everything colorful so that they can get out of the black and smoke and all those things that depressing, you know, down the dump. The children have such needs emotionally and physically. They've been either abused physically or, or sexually or emotionally that it's just trauma traumatized them and it's caused them trouble in their studies also. So our main emphasis not is just not as in the studying or in the eating, but our main emphasis is having them to know the Lord so that the Lord can heal them of their of their wounds that they've had in their life. At 
at the end of the first year, I, I got all the kids together, you know, and I was really proud of them. They had come a long way. For kids who had never had studied before, you know, they were learning colors, they were learning how to write, they were learning how to write their name. They were even, even some of them learned how to read in that first year. And it was just a blessing to see how much they had progressed. The end of the first school year brought Kari the feeling of success. The only complaint she heard from her children was that they had to leave for summer break. It was the end of October and we were finishing up our last activities and I said, you know, I'm really proud of you guys. You guys have come a long way. You've learned how to read and write. Some of them are going to first grade, some are going to second grade. Um, you just come a long way. For some of the children that attend Mi Refugio, it's more than just a school. It's become home. I've had nine kids that have been abandoned to me here at the school. Um, three of the brothers were drug addicts. They were glue sniffers. And they would just come high. They'd be left on the street. Their mother would just abandon them completely. She'd go off with other men and, and drink herself and get into drugs herself. And the boys would be on the street. They'd beg for bread. And they'd, they'd just come dirty and filthy. Even the other kids would reject them because they were even dirtier than the rest of them. When we first visited Kari in early 1990, Mi Refugio had a total enrollment of about 50 children. One year later, the school has grown over to 100 students with two locations, both close to the dump. But the year was not without sadness. The Guatemalan government thought it was inappropriate for a single American woman to care for the nine children who made Mi Refugio their full-time home. The government demanded the children be sent to foster homes. Within three months, the children had run away from the foster homes and were back in the dump. We were there when one of the children, Juan Carlos, came back to the school to visit with Kari. This is one of the boys that I used to have at the house, um, one of the nine kids that ran away when he knew that the court system was going to take him away. This is Juan Carlos. He's 13 years old, and um, his brothers and sisters make him sniff glue just to keep him on the same level as they are. But he really doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to sniff glue, and he never wanted to leave the house. And when I told the courts that he was back in the dump sniffing glue and was dirty and wasn't eating properly, they, they, just, they just said that they were glad that he wasn't with me anymore. He's been real hesitant to come back because he's afraid that they're going to take him away. The court system apologized for what they've done. But it was, it's, it's really too late for me to take the kids in without damaging them emotionally again. And today he came to visit me and he's telling me right now that a little girl died in the dump and that they're going to have a funeral for her. This is a wall of sorrow. It contains the remains of infants and preschool children. But for those children who die in the dump, there'll be no marker. It's as if they never existed. Of the nine children whom the government removed from Kari's care, only one was able to escape the dump's deadly grip. Kari was able to convince the government to place Gustavo Rivera in the care of her friend, Robert Rose. The boy who was abandoned in the dump was given a chance to succeed, and he made the most of it. children at Mi Refugio have special needs, but Rafael Castellanos are unique. He was born without the use of his left arm. That's been hesitant for him to be able to function because sometimes in the classroom other kids can do other things that he's not able to do and he'll just sit there and he won't respond and then I'll call him and I'll try to nurture him and say, okay, you can do this. You know, we'll do it a different way, but we'll, we'll be able to, um, to help him to feel comfortable. How are 
are you? Come on, start. Good. Bien. Hey, Raphael. I am a one. When word of Raphael's condition reached Dr. John Kagan, one of the many grassroots supporters Kari has in the United States, he decided to do what he could to help. Together with prosthetic specialist Steve Fries, they flew to Guatemala from Florida to see if they could make a difference in Raphael's life. I guess what I'm worried about is the fact that it's extensor outcropping here. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's smaller than his spur, essentially. It was apparent that what Raphael needed was a body-powered prosthesis which in effect serves as an artificial hand. We're gonna measure this, your arm, so we can make a little hand for you, okay? All right. Three and a quarter inches in circumference. Okay, hold your, hold your hand out like this. We'll be able to fit this little boy with a prosthesis that will enable him to function more independently in his, in his classroom, in his life out here with his family in, in the dump. Um, we'll provide him with an additional level of dexterity. We'll need to make the prosthesis very, very durable, and uh, we'll need to accommodate his growth so that he'll be able to use this for a number of years, hopefully in the future. Let's have you sit up here for me, just for a second. Good. There you Good. go. Muy bien. This'll work, this'll work. Fantastic. When the artificial arm was finally completed and the moment of truth had arrived, it was apparent that the hard work had paid off. Excellent day, good, good. His smile told the story. Okay. Now relax, tell me relax. Now tighten up. Tighten up again. Watch this. After a few minutes yeah. of instruction, yeah. Raphael was performing yeah. practical yeah. functions yeah. with his right. arm for the very first time. Yeah. yeah. Now with a Hold it up. Great. All right. All right. Good. 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 There you go. Give me a hug, little guy. Good. You did good. You did real good. His life in the dump will be, for the most part, unchanged. But with a little help from two people who showed some concern, his future seems a lot brighter. The darkness of the dump is illuminated by the faith of a woman, a woman determined to make a future for the dump's children. Fugio represents hope, faith, and love against all odds. The school is a place that I wouldn't mind have, have grown up in myself. That's, that's how comfortable I feel here at the school. The kids are well cared for, they're supervised, they're, they're clean. Again, they're being presented with an opportunity to, to break out of what might be a very miserable life for them. They're being taught the, the basics and fundamentals of, of mathematics and grammar and, and skills, working skills. And again, it's all the product of, of one woman's faith. Boy, oh boy. You realize, first of all, how fortunate you are to live where you live, to have the opportunities that you have, that your family has. And you realize that you can do something for other people and that the things that you do can be worthwhile. And you don't have to worry how small those things might be because in some people's eyes, even the small things that you do are great. When the school first opened its doors, supplies were scarce, but the resources that Kari needed to keep things going came from where they always had in the past her faith. People always ask me what religion I am, but I really don't believe in a religion. I believe, I believe that we can all know God if we look within ourselves, and that it's a relationship. A religion it puts you in a box, whereas a relationship draws you closer to God. Well, we're, as I said before, you know, we live by faith. I go to a church here, but we're not under the church. You know, the church hasn't sent me out. It's just a mission that God has given us to, given me to start. The funds are sent home to my, to my home address where, where they're sent back to me directly. And um, it's easier that way than sending them directly here to Guatemala because of the mail system. A lot of mail is opened and stolen from and, and um, 
they, get, they know who's an American and who's not by the address and everything. And it's just safer to be sent to the States. From there, just our major needs are, are a lot of prayer. We need a lot of prayer to, to keep us functioning. There's a lot of spiritual battles that we have, and um, it really just affects us here. We need a lot of personnel that are dedicated to work with these type of children, to understand the needs that they have and have love and compassion. Um, it's, not, it's not just teaching a class, you know, it's more of being able to give to the child completely. You went to see them? Steve, did you see him? Hey there, I sure did. Hi, Rafael. Yeah, good to see you. Hola. Como esta? Bien? Dr. John Kagan and Steve Fries returned to Guatemala to check on the progress of their patient, Rafael. He's become more friendly, he's more open, he, he relates more to the other kids, he doesn't shy away as he used to do. He's even talked more. Fantastic. They're pleased to hear about the progress Rafael has made. Still, Rafael's mother has other concerns. She said she's really concerned because he's just, he's just very rebellious and he doesn't, doesn't listen to her. And um, even though he has the arm and, and we've done so much for, you've done so much for him, she said, that, um, She's very concerned for his future, because <coughs> now he's older, you know, he's eight. Soon there's another concern that threatens Rafael and all the dumps residents. Well, right now there's um, a real concern about the cholera coming to, to Guatemala, and there's been a lot of prevention about it, and a lot of talks in the schools and in the areas, and we've had a lot of talks with the parents, and trying to get them prepared. And that's a real concern because we're just praying that it won't hit us, especially the people in the dump, because they would be more susceptible to it than anybody else. <laughs> the concerns about cholera are soon justified. We've got a guy that's very sick and needs to go to the hospital now, so we need some help getting him out of here. When we came in today, uh, one of the little children came up and said that his brother was dying. And uh, so we went into the house, and sure enough, uh, he was right. I mean, I'm telling you, he doesn't have a pulse. I'm telling you, he's sick. His brother was uh, in shock. Blanket's gonna tap. No car drive. So we picked him up and carried him to the local hospital and I helped out uh, on getting some lines and IV started and turns out that he has cholera, but uh, he, he's probably gonna make it. The cholera epidemic is no longer a threat and Maximilian de la Roca is back to his daily routine of working in the dump. Although he remembers very little of what happened to him, he has a few words for Dr. Kagan. Uh, he says uh, he appreciates him a lot because if he wouldn't have helped him, he would have died. They're hiding. Hey, I see you. John Bafar continues to file stories about Kari's works on a television station in Fort Myers, Florida. The air in the fourth world is thick and heavy. Tonight, from this Guatemala City dump, I'll tell you how. Soon after, other reporters from his home state follow. Their only hope lies in the hearts of caring people, people such as Kari Engel. And they begin filing stories about an amazing American who saves kids from a place called the Fourth World. Our top story tonight, an outpouring of community support and prayers following our special report on the fourth world. Our lobby packed with shoes and clothes and tools to help the people who call the Guatemalan city dump home. The reports tonight, of Kari's mission, which air in the United States, draw an enormous response from television viewers. Donations are packed in boxes and it takes a cargo plane to deliver all that has been donated. The plane touches down in Guatemala with several tons of supplies. Well, when they first told me on the telephone that it was a couple tons of, of stuff, I, they asked me if I was sitting down, and I said I, I, I wasn't. And they said, well, you better sit down. And they said, well, we have a couple tons of stuff. Not just a couple boxes, but tons. I just was like, I can't believe it, you know. I mean, and I thought of just Fort Myers, 
compared to all the states. And to think that just that one place has just been touched so much. And I thank God for that. And I thank the people that have, that have given from their hearts and from their homes and to share with these children that haven't had the blessing. It's God's blessing. It just shows that, that God has just touched more hearts to show about the school and to be able to share with more people about what's going on. And, and it's just a time of, of His, for me, it's, it's an encouraging time to finish up the, the old year, bring in the new um, with refreshment, um, with joy, to bring more to these children than we've ever thought we could do. <laughs> A lot of people are questioning because our funds are going down, um, we were losing staff, we weren't getting the, 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 the strength that we needed to be able to keep the school running. And last year we almost had to close the school and a lot of people said, well, if you don't have the funds, are you going to have to close? And I said, no, I won't close until God tells me to close. Through just this, it just shows me that God still wants me to keep going and I'll keep on going until he says stop. And he hasn't said stop yet, so. <laughs> Amazingly, the children with so little have spirits that soar. Gracias. They pay back the generosity Gracias. with smiles to the well-wishers, whom they'll probably never meet. Gracias. Gracias. I really Gracias. believe that, that the Lord is going to is blessing this, this school and is allowing it to grow. And I believe that even though we may not keep this building, only the Lord knows what's gonna happen the next year is the end of the contract. But God, God is gonna provide an, a, a place for our own, you know, where we can just construct, we can have it say, this is our place, this will be for the people. Um, I really believe um, um, the Lord will give us in the future a piece of land big enough to construct even a community center where we can have the trade school and the school on it at the same time, where the parents can come and learn, but they can also work so that they won't, they won't worry about being, being fed, they won't have to worry about any needs, but they can learn to be able to progress and, and to become somebody in the community and not just an outcast. Seven years after opening the doors of Mi Refugio, the unthinkable occurs. The owners of the school building have decided to sell the building. And overnight, the sounds of hope are silenced. Everything that Kari has worked so hard for has vanished. And the children are back in the dump, sniffing glue to once again numb the pain. I love them so much. And I and I just I just want to see them be okay, you know. They become a part of you. They become as if they're your own. The school has been closed for an entire year. Kari searches for a new home for the school and runs down dozens of leads that all turn into dead ends. Another team of American journalists do what they can to help find a piece of land that would be appropriate. They arrange meetings with the United States Ambassador's office in Washington, and while everyone is sympathetic, no one really does anything that makes a difference. All seems lost until Paul Bush a businessman from the United States, hears about Kari's needs and decides to help. He gives her the money she needs to put a deposit on her own piece of property in San Pedro. Soon, others also contribute to the cause of purchasing 12 acres of greenery located a 30-minute drive from the dump. The property is ideal to bring the children away from the smoldering embers of the dump to the serene setting of the countryside for the very first time. Well, it's, uh, 
incredible is the only word that I can think of. Uh, we're here seeing all this, and I don't know if I really understand it all. I mean, there's unbelievable poverty. It's, uh, you see the birds and the garbage and people living in this, and yet I see kids smiling and, and trying to live some kind of a life, and life just goes on through all of this. Uh, I also see that uh, with just so little help can mean so much to, to some of these kids and change their lives so much. And you know, Kari, what, it, what she's doing, an American woman, to come down here and live and get to know these people and gain their trust and try to create a new life for, for these kids to get out of here and to get into the mainstream and to become useful, happy people. I think what she's doing is just incredible. Okay, but money is buenos dias. Buenos dias. While Kari appreciates the contributions, she's not at all comfortable with the status of saint. I'm really nothing without God, and I'm nobody. And um, God is the one that has directed me to be here. <laughs> not charity in the sense where you're just giving away money, uh, you're, you're, you're giving away something that's going to multiply. You're educating these children, you're giving them a new vision. Uh, that's going to change their lives. It, it, it has this uh, multiplying factor and uh, they're help if we can help them help themselves, uh, that makes it worth a lot more. <laughs> When the school day ends, it's back to the dump for the children. I wanted to experience what their world was like at night. What is going on? Well, the, the, as you can see, the, and you can hear it in the background, you can hear them picking through the trash, going through the trucks, still, still, tr still working. Do the trucks come all day and all night with trash? Um, they don't come into the night. These are the last trucks that will come in. And later on, other particular trucks, like, you know, from the city or other people will come in and they will either be robbed or they will be, they will just dump their trash and may run somebody over not being able to see them. The last garbage trucks make their way out of the dump well after nightfall. But the job of recycling goes on into the early morning hours. The children appear out of nowhere. just as quickly disappear into the darkness. On any given night, untold stories of sexual abuse and violence take place here under the cover of darkness. It was also here at night that Kari experienced an unforgettable tragedy involving the school's cook, Doña Juana. One night, she and her husband went into the dump to, to pick through the trash and a truck came and came where she was and backed up over her. And the husband tried to tell the driver that she was under the wheel and she couldn't, um, she couldn't get out because he wouldn't move the truck. When the truck finally did move, it was of little use because the ambulance refused to enter into the dump at night. Soon after, Doña Juana died. Doña Juana left behind four boys and an alcoholic husband who was unable to care for his children. It was up to Kari to care for the boys. The father didn't want to take care of the kids. They didn't want to um, be a father to these four kids. So we just started praying and we tried to take care of the kids, you know, help him to become the dad and really become the strong point of the family. And he just couldn't handle it. He couldn't, he couldn't be the father. And he said he didn't want to have the kids anymore. Not wanting to split the family up, Kari searches for a family willing to adopt all four brothers. The task is even more difficult because Matt, the oldest boy, suffers from cerebral palsy. Silver Valenzuela was one of Kari's original students. When he arrived on her doorstep, he could neither read nor write. A, B, C, D, e, F, H, H, e. He excelled during the four years he spent at the school. But needing money to support his family, he returned once again to the dump. 
and worked part-time at the school. Well, Bilber was, was with us for a while working, and then he dropped his job. And then by the beginning of the year, his mom came and asked me to help him look for, look for him because he had been disappeared for three days. And we looked into the hospitals and the police, and we, we didn't have any sign or any clue of where he was at. And um, then we, we got the news that he was found in the dump and cut into pieces. His head had been chopped off in his arm, and, and they, they buried him. The loss of so many close friends in such a short period of time inevitably takes a heavy toll on Kari. It's it's very it's very devastating because you you you've seen a child you've been working with them and and you take them into your heart he becomes part of you and when you lose them like that it's just it's just uh, it's very hard to express the pain that you feel and. You want to ignore it because you just you feel it a lot, and it's and it's sometimes it's hard to to um, to face. Among the tragic stories that have unfolded over the years, there are many of hope. Oliver also learned to read and write at Mi Refugio. Today, he is just two years from achieving his goal of becoming an accountant. Oliver, what advice would you, as a success story, give to little children living in the dump for how their life could change? The parents have to realize what the kids are, are, are doing to make sure they're not getting into trouble, to watch out more for them, and to let them know that without God, we can't do anything. After more than a year of not having a school to go to, the day has finally come to start up again. The children line up before dawn at the original trade school. They are transformed from dump children to clean-cut school children once again. Still several are not allowed to make the trip for a few days because of lice. Kari introduces the man who helped make their first trip away from the dump possible. The children step aboard the bus, a step that signifies more than just a ride. It's a chance at a new life. The trip takes them away from the city and to an oasis of their very own. A place where the children see trees and smell fresh air for the very first time. It's incredible. It's a joyful day. I mean, a transformation right from this morning when we saw those kids that were in the dump and, and with the animals and all the squalor dressed and clean and smiling and their parents smiling and getting onto the school bus and coming up here. Um, it's like taking them into a whole different world. I think it's a, it's a minor miracle.
A good education is what will help the children break free of the dump's deadly grip. That education also comes in the form of vocational skills that allow the children to earn a steady income outside the dump. Kari has helped us a lot in our schooling, and she's also helped my parents, who work in the dump and don't make enough money. Kari has helped me since I was a little girl. Kari's assistance has not only been gratefully received, but it has also inspired some students to make career choices for their future. I would like to help people in need, the way Kari helps us all. Well, for us, she's heaven sent. She not only helps us, but she gives us the love we need. Artist Tite Baquero hopes that art may also play a part in making the school self-sufficient. Well, I was inspired by the work of Kari and others, and I thought that I could contribute with art, since art is a vehicle that can be used to inspire, to challenge. And I thought that I could create a simple enough thing that the whole world could look at and realize that such an enormous work is being done here in Guatemala at Mirafuca. <laughs> Several years have passed since Rafael was fitted for his prosthetic arm. Today he plays in the streets outside his home with the one thing that has always brought a smile to his face, his dog. I'm invited into Rafael's home by his parents. Rafael is anxious to show off his new kittens. Oh, wow. I inquire as to what has become of his prosthetic arm. You can see that he's grown up and, and he's 12 years old now and, and he um, needed another arm. So we just started to pray and I told him that, that you know, God could bring some more doctors down and help him out. He one day, a couple months later after that, he came into the school with, with this new arm that he has on. And I said, I said, well, where did you get that? You know, did you get it at, at the other institutions that are here working? He said, no, a man from one of the trash trucks just gave it to me. And he found it off one of the trucks. Kari left home to follow her heart. But in it, she carries along the encouragement from family and friends who continue to support and inspire her. Kari constantly reminds me that without the heart and hard work of the dedicated Guatemalan staff, none of this would be possible. I have a lot of people that are amazing, that God has, that God has touched and has brought them to, to help this ministry to grow and to become what it is today. It's his ministry, and I believe that he's, God is the one that touches the lives of the people. And he's touched my parents' life by allowing them to be so supportive of, of, my, of my being in this country, in Guatemala. Some who don't understand her mission often ask the question, why Guatemala when people are suffering in the United States? The answer, it seems, is that Kari's heart knows no borders. I think a lot of people ask me why I'm here in Guatemala, but I think, I think it just comes from your heart and you just need to follow that and know that, that God is there in each one of our hearts. We'll just look for him. And he's gonna lead us to love wherever we are and whatever we do. More than a year has passed since Kari has seen the four boys left behind when the school's cook was killed in the dump. They were all four adopted into, into Indiana, and they're in Indiana right now. But I, I hope to be able to see them someday again. Oh, 
it's good to see you. Oh, look, it's Matt. Hey, Matt. Hey, Zach. Hi. How you going? How you doing? Good. Good. You? good. Great. The it's reunion so is a memorable one. It is apparent that not only have the children adjusted to the environment, but they're speaking fluid English. I'm used to talking in English now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you always wanted to talk English, remember? And their lives are filled with love. I just never dreamed that my life could be so blessed. Um, when these boys came, I expected that we would be overwhelmed. And instead, we've just been greatly blessed. Um, the boys have just added new dimension to our home. They've added excitement to our home. They've just brought so much love to our home and um, a blessing is just the only way I can describe it. It was just like they were our own kids right off the bat. From the moment we got on a plane and until we got off, there was no problems whatsoever. It was like they were born into our family. The Guatemala dump may be thousands of miles away, but the memories of their father and that horrific place have not faded for these children. What did he say? Well, he wanted to know how you were doing. And I told him that everyone's in school. Well, they, they tell us about their father. They realize that he was an alcoholic and he was physically and verbally abusive to them and their mother. We've explained to them that maybe it was their mother's time. The Lord felt that she had endured enough and they had a home for them away from, from Guatemala and away from that situation. That's why he placed them in our home. But they pray for their father and they hope that someday he'll be saved and they'll meet him in heaven. I know it was a hard situation to go through and it was very traumatic for the kids and for myself and for, for the whole family. But I know God's hand was in it and we didn't understand it at the time. But just through the different prayers that we had prayed with, with the kids' mom and seeing the best for them, I can see God's hand working. Such a blessing to watch his hand work in intricate ways to see his kids come out in the end on top. The pain of dealing with death and heartache is very much a part of the cycle of life in the Guatemala dump. But on this Christmas, four boys play in a snow-filled field in Indiana, having broken that cycle. <laughs> Above all, Kari keeps in mind the vision she had when she first decided to open Mi Refugio. The vision that he gave me was a vision of a whole bunch of kids on a hill, and they were all coming down. It was like a sea of kids. They were all smiling, you know. They were all poor, but they were, they were, they hardly had any clothes on, you know. They didn't have any shoes on. But the one thing that I did notice in them is that they were smiling. And that's the blessing that God gave me through that vision is the kids smiling. And I believe that through this school that he's provided and all the needs that he's given, that, that we can see a, a hope and a future given to these children. Kari has been described by many as meek. But to me, it's amazing what one woman from a foreign country has been able to accomplish in the most hopeless conditions. It makes me wonder what the world would be like if each of us followed our own hearts to help out in whatever way we can. Because I know now and have proof that one person really can change the world. Yeah.